PhD in Progress episode 12. This week we discuss the strategies and tools we use to focus and improve our productivity. Let's go! Yeah, we're getting into it. All right. Welcome back to the PhD in Progress podcast, where we talk about your education, your career, and your life. I'm Jason. And I'm Kelly. And today, we don't have other guests or other co-hosts. Nikhil might be coming in later on. Yeah, so if you hear him come in very Kramer-like through the door, and he'll be waving his arms in frantic (laughs) uh, ways, maybe we'll see that. But... Today we're going to talk about tools and tips we have to improve the quality of your life and the productivity you might want to um, introduce into your own work. First, we kind of want to talk about the problem, right? The, the problem of how do we get more done, how are we more efficient with the time we have in our lives, and what we can do to solve this problem. So all anyone ever has is 168 hours in a week, right? Thomas Edison had 168. I have 168. But yet, (laughs) Thomas Edison did so much more. Yes. Why is that, Jason? And before the nerds get angry, Nikola Tesla also had 168. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Um, And there are many reasons for this, right? We we have so many different (laughs) obligations and different things that we want to set our time into. is it enough just to 24 hours a day minus sleep be working all the time and not having any enjoyment out of your life in other areas? Or Drive me crazy. Yes, drive me crazy too. <laughs> but it would also drive me crazy to not be productive at all and just be walking around and enjoying the sunlight. I don't know, that kind of sounds like a good life. It, it sounds kind of good for a little bit, but... Until aren't... you realize you have no money. Yes. <laughs> But you must be on vacation sometime. Remember back to whenever you had vacation time, <laughs> when you're like, I need to be doing something. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, even on vacation, something... I like to do something. Yeah, you like to make or create or yeah. think or something like that. Mm-hmm. And after a really long vacation, especially one with your parents, you go, God, I can't wait to get back yes. in the lab. <laughs> <laughs> this show is going to be about how we get the most out of our work week and also how we maintain a sense of balance in our life, right? Kind of hinted before about straying away from the term work-life balance because I think it's all... It's all life balance. Yeah, work is part of life and relationships are part of life and learning is part of life and everything's part of life. So um, instead we want to make sure that the person feels good about the, the balances they have throughout all segments of their life, not just work versus life. Right? Mm-hmm. My father always yells at me about this. Yeah? Because I say, like, oh, it's school, you know, it's work, whatever. And he's like, this is your life. This is This is, your is life. the life that you chose. This is what you're aiming towards, all this kind of thing. He's like, stop calling it school. Stop saying you're trapped. This is what you chose. This yes. is your life. You're living it right now. Yes. And <laughs> to go off on a slight tangent before we begin that, that's kind of like one of the big or one of my big goals to enforce in my life is not to think like the victim, right? Like you said. Mm-hmm. And, and everyone does it at some point, and it's okay. Yep. It's normal. It's human. Be like, oh, can't believe I'm stuck here doing this thing I don't want to be doing. But you have the choice. You don't have to. You don't You, you don't ever have to be doing that experiment. Yes, mm-hmm. if you want your degree to but that's, work out but for that's you what you're at choosing. some point. You, you're yes. choosing that the degree means more to you than stepping away from something that you're not enjoying at the moment. Exactly. It's all a choice. And once you take into that, uh, or step into that mindset of everything you do is your choice, then it gives you so much more power over your own life mm-hmm. and everything you do. Mm-hmm. Right? So it just changes that perspective a little bit. And yeah, new mindset. Yeah. It's not like you're five anymore and your parents are forcing you to go to kindergarten. You are a grown adult and you are making the choices you make to either improve your life or 
make your life worse. It, mm-hmm. It's all up to you. Mm-hmm. Okay. So with that in mind, we want to talk about tools and strategies to improve our lives and the way we go about our productivity and our work and whatever else we might need to be going through. However, first, there are a few things we want to talk about kind of as a disclaimer. First, I think when you think about productivity, it's really easy to fall into the trap of trying to be super efficient all the time or um, just keeping on trying new methods of improvement somehow. So it's one of those things that can get kind of addictive and in learning and constantly implementing different things, you kind of don't end up being productive at all, right? So yeah, this episode is meant to introduce a few different things you might want to try. Things that have worked for us. Things that have worked for us, yes. Yes. And this by no means is a comprehensive list of everything no. that we even have thought about, right? It's mm-hmm. just a couple of things we want to talk about. Um, so and don't we, get... And, and, and we welcome your input on the blog or email about things that have worked for you so for we can sure. share them with the community. Yeah. So please don't get obsessed with being efficient or any of this mindset, right? We, we're trying to improve it, uh, improve your lifestyle. And additionally, it's better to take one step at a time, right? So try one of these techniques if you haven't tried it before and, you know, test it out for a bit. See if it's working for you. If it's not, you don't need to keep on with it. But um, it's really up to you. But really just don't get too crazy with this. If your life is going well and you, you enjoy the amount of work you get done and what you're doing, you know, don't feel compelled. It's yeah. up to you. Uh, first, I want to talk about a little, or first I want to talk about a couple of programs I've used in order to organize the resources I use in my research, um, and they're both very similar. So one is a PC program called Mendeley, and another is a Mac program called Papers. I've used Papers. You've used Papers? Mm-hmm. I've used both. Okay. And so this is good. All right. If you're not familiar, um, these are two programs that are very useful for organizing whatever research articles you might have Mm -hmm. um, through whatever journals or, uh, I guess, catalogs that you might be searching through. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's the thing. It makes it super easy to search for what you're looking for. When you say, oh, remember this fact, where was the paper? You can search for it by keyword. You know, you don't even have to remember what paper it was from. Before I got this... um, this program, I I still do also, but I just had a stack of papers in my filing cabinet that I would literally have to shuffle through one at a time and go where where is what I'm looking for? Yes. Where is you know? Which of course, seems doesn't it in retrospect seem ridiculous, right? Like yeah. you were pr- basically doing the way people have been doing it for hundreds of years. Meanwhile, you had this computer that had all the knowledge in the world yes right next to that huge pile of papers mm-hmm. um so both these <laughs> programs mendeley and papers both kind of act as a uh a collection of the downloaded usually pdfs that we find um but a collection of these articles and so the best uh i guess the best is it an analogy or a metaphor um so what I've heard it You'd be described as <laughs> is iTunes for all your research articles. Okay. Like right? That. So you can organize them by the authors, the title, the journal. Uh, it kind of looks like, both of them kind of look like iTunes. Yeah, they do. Um, you can search through them. It actually searches through the words of your PDF file. So if mm-hmm. you couldn't remember it, you could look up maybe the keywords or mm-hmm. part of the title. Um, you can make air quote playlists and say, oh, this is the list of papers that have to do with zebrafish development. Yes. I should know these. And and it's been great. So actually both these programs I I think I used paper early on because I I switched back and forth between Mac and PC. <laughs> I'm weird like that, I know. Um but I wish I knew about papers before I had taken my my general Absolutely. Exam, which, oh my or, god. Uh, qualifying exam. That would have been great. I instead had the binder full of a couple hundred papers that there's no way I, 
if I looked at that now, I wouldn't be able to remember anything. No. It's, no it's that's the same thing. I think I had that pile of papers from, from the general exam, and yeah. they've just been sitting there ever since. And just everything about these two programs are really helpful. Um, one of my favorite features is it's showing uh, whether or not you've printed it or not. So if you look at the the uh, metadata of the file that you have in Papers or Mendeley, it'll show if you printed the file out or not, mm. which I definitely have papers I've printed out three or four times, and I'll be like, oh, I can't find it, so I print it out, I print it out again, and then a couple days later I go through my binder and I can't I yep. find the next one, <laughs> I'm like, oh, crap. Uh, so yeah, those are two things, and also everything we list today will be in the show notes, um, and I'll, I'll talk to, uh, I'll tell you where you can find that later on, but it'll be on their site at phdinprogress.com. Mendeley is free for PC, and Papers, I forget what the it's, cost was, but yeah. they have a free trial, um, and there's a discount if you can prove that you're a student. I don't even remember what proof I yeah. did. Yeah. I think I was, like, on a website for our school. Did you have to send a in, but transcript or something? No, not a transcript. Like, an unofficial transcript. Yeah, it might just be, like, an unofficial statement, and I... Yeah. Yeah. I forget exactly what it was. Um, it's also a European company. I forget what country it was in, but... Oh. Yeah. So, sorry, but I'll list the sites on the <laughs> line. I wish, I, wish I looked at the prices before. That would have been a good host... Uh, job right there but i mean the papers fee is not oh yeah so I, much that you're not going to do it and really when i use papers and this was five years ago or so and i switched over to mendeley um but papers was great and i looking back i totally would have paid that fee probably every year mm -hmm. i think i ended up paying like 20 or 30 dollars for it and yeah. it was fine yep yep uh also i think both of these by now have like tablet and Android and iPhone equivalents. Mm. So Mendeley, I know, has an iPad uh, app, and I just transitioned to reading papers off an iPad. So can you sync that with like yeah. the papers that you actually have on your computer? Uh huh. Oh. Yeah. So every the whole library is synced up in the cloud up oh. there, and so I tend to download all the papers on my PC. And then when I open up my tablet and I'm on Wi-Fi, it'll update and it will download whatever, whatever papers are new in my oh, library. Oh, I need up. to do that. Yeah, it's really cool. Nice. So those are resource number one, uh, Mendeley and papers. So let's move on to a time management and also life management tool called Google Calendar. I don't know if you've heard of this. It's a new feature. Yeah, <laughs> new. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, there's a lot to say about Google Calendar, I think, and maybe what's the best thing about it? There's so well, much I, that's great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just love it for this, the simple fact of what we were just talking about, that I can access it from anywhere and sync it up on all my devices so that at any point, if I'm with somebody and I only have my phone on me, I can plug it right into the calendar right there and it syncs with every other calendar that I have yeah. on my computer, my iPad, everything. Mm -hmm. So um, I love it just for that fact that I'm, I'm never without my complete schedule so I can know and tell people when I'm available. I think I enjoyed it a lot because... In the past, I tried to use paper-based planners, right? And it always annoyed me that I would write things in, and then with science and other distractions that come up in lab, like, I might plan a time for me to do my experiment, and then my boss wants to meet with me for an, an, for an hour randomly, and I'm like, okay, I have to shift everything down, and then I have to, uh, I guess, erase or scribble out my pen that I wrote in my calendar, but with Google Calendar, you can just easily move everything around. Um, it's free, and part of the, probably the most useful thing for me, um, and I had mentioned this really briefly in the relationship episode, in episode 11, mm. um, is that my girlfriend and I share uh, Google Calendars with each other. So I have my own, and she has her own, and then we also have a joint one. So yeah. if... 
We even have that for the outreach program, too. We oh, yeah. share it with all the members so we can all update it. We can all see what's going on, and it all syncs with all of our own calendars. That's perfect. So. Right. And mm-hmm. so I know a lot of lab groups have something like this going on. Um, uh, like I said, with me and my girlfriend, we can... She knows which nights I plan on staying late because she can just look at the calendar and be like, okay, he's, Jason's not going to come back home. Maybe I should eat dinner before midnight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. You don't even have to text her. She just knows by looking at yeah, the calendar. Exactly. Um, and the same works for her. She can have a meeting, and I'll, I'll be like, okay, I don't have to get home right now. Um, and there are so many other options you can have with this program. You can, I guess another useful thing is that when I get an email with uh, a seminar that I want to go to, a lot of times Google will can read through the email, the, the program Google, if you're opening in Gmail, um, and it'll find the time and the date and the, the name of the seminar, and you can just click on it, and it'll automatically put it into your calendar. Wow. Like so, it highlights for you, and all you got to do yeah. is click right on it? Yeah, so it like underlines Wednesday wow. at 2 p.m., and then it'll use the title of the email usually, so mm. like Wednesday seminar, mm. or whatever. That's great. Yeah, I found it very useful. Because otherwise, I always forget when the seminars are. And then I have, never end up going. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think lately for me, it's kind of become a choice. It's like, do I get my more work done or my seminar listening done? And It's a very easy choice for me because I just don't go. Yeah. So. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> <laughs> I only go to seminars when they're at conferences and they're in concentrated periods of time and I just go, okay, I can do everything all at once. <laughs> See, I, I enjoy conference seminars because there's usually coffee and if there's not, mm-hmm. I can be mad at them for not having coffee. Yes. 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 If you ever run a conference, by the way, very big tangent, have coffee at everything. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the last conference that I, that I had, they also had monster cookies. I'm talking like six to eight inch diameter on that thing, like massive cookies. Uh-huh. They were so, right next. To when the you coffee. said monster cookie, I was thinking Cookie Monster. No. <laughs> yeah. Just no. like blue monster and like size. googly eyes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they had Cookie Monster by the coffee, going, "Hey, eat some coffee." <laughs> Is that how he talks? <laughs> he slightly Italian. Yeah, yeah I imagine he's got. <laughs> Big, big dude with an Italian accent. Yes, that, that is the cookie monster. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> that maybe he lives on Sesame Street, right? Is it Sesame? Is Sesame Street? <laughs> 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 yeah, Sesame. Oh, wow. It, does that mean, very, I don't know. <laughs> very uninformed podcast you're listening to right now. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So, anything else we can mention with Google Calendar <laughs> before we move on to the next thing? Oh, my God. Um, I think that's good for me. Yeah, it's pretty good, all right? Yeah. All right. So, we mentioned Mendeley Papers, Google Google Calendar, and now I think we're going to jump off of the technology bandwagon for a little bit mm-hmm. and talk more about personal development and personal management. And so, one thing I'm really big out big on is identifying the goals I have for myself, whether it be in work or relationships or whatever. Like, this podcast is one of them. I have certain goals I'm trying to achieve with the podcast. One of the the big things you can do for your own productivity is knowing those goals um, outright. And there are a couple of important things that make having a very helpful goal. Right? You can't just be like, I'm going to lose weight. So if you just think about New Year's resolutions, for example. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Right. (laughs) Everyone says they want to lose weight or get in better shape or something. But those are the worst kinds of goals you can make for yourself. Why? Because there's not. How do you know when you're in better shape? Yeah, they're open ended. Yes. You need more defined quantitative things that you can. Yes. See. You want them to be specific. Mm-hmm. You want them to be measurable. Yes. And you want them to be clear. Yes. Right? So, going on, instead of having that um, what, lose weight thing, 
how about have lose 15 pounds by May 15th? Bikini season, baby. Yes, exactly. <laughs> be ready. My beach bod for Memorial Day. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Which is a day in the U.S. for our listeners oh, abroad. Oh, yes, that's true. Yeah, so we have a very international audience. <laughs> ranging from Canada to... Canada. Canada. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. We, we actually have... Another tangent. We have listeners everywhere, and actually, I've heard from a couple of them. It's been great. So, definitely, most of the primarily English-speaking countries. So, our lovely listeners in Great Britain or really? the UK in general. Wow. Yes, um, Australia. We have. Um, we've got everywhere, really. Wow. We've got a bunch of people in Scandinavia. I'm open to Italy mountain, and France. I'm open to and, mountain men from all countries. Yes. So. <laughs> Got some Andes men? Yes. Maybe, yes. yeah. All right. <laughs> Kidding. Himalayans? Ooh. Yeah. Adventurous, right? Wow. Yeah, very adventurous. Anyway. <laughs> but anyway, back, back to the the goal-making thing. Any Cookie Monster Italians? Um, cookie Monster Italians. <laughs> How about just the guy who plays Cookie Monster in Italy? Oh, my God. <laughs> this is, this okay. is a train wreck of a We're show. Done. Okay. So I'll get edited out oh, unless geez. I forget. I'm just going crazy. Yes. Today. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, so, do you want to go? Go ahead. You're you're the leader of this. Just go. Am I? I'm not the leader of anything. This it's sucks. your podcast. God, I know, and that's why I have co-hosts. I just I'm really here. bad at this. <laughs> so do I. Oh. All right. So hey, yeah, you definitely want your your goals to be measurable and clear and concise and have a deadline and all these things. So that's the first part of setting a goal, is to define the goal. Uh, what really helps is also to just write it out. You might think that, okay, I can remember this. I know I have this general, vague concept of a goal I have for my life. But there's nothing really tying it to the real world until you write it down and you can see it. Put it out there in the universe. Yes. Yeah. Although there's some, there's some research to say that when you say that you have this goal to people, part of your... Oh, I wish I had Nikhil, because he would know the neuroscience. Although you you know some neuroscience. <laughs> You're right. A fruit fly courtship. <laughs> um, but one of, the, one of the things I say is that when you make known your intentions, part of your brain has already, I guess, fired off to the centers that make you think that you already completed that goal or really? that intention. Yes. Yeah. So when you say, oh, I'm going to run 10 miles tomorrow morning, watch, and then you tell everyone, part of your brain already thinks, oh, man, I've already run 10 miles. And it gets that little yeah. dopamine release. Yeah. And then you, you already have it. So you're like, okay, I don't need yeah. to, which is different than just keeping it to yourself and holding yourself ac accountable for it. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. So that's one of the, the dangers to this. But it, it's definitely important to be able to write it out and see it and have that as a theme that you work to or live to. Mm -hmm. Right? I try, as much as possible, I try to fill my day up with things that help achieve a goal. Right? Mm -hmm. There's not so much... There's not so much I do in any given day that isn't aligned with me achieving one of my goals. Really? Yeah. Which that's, sounds that's crazy, right? Incredible. It, there's not too much, all right? So obviously jumping on Facebook for a little more time than I'd like to in the scheme of things is not helpful. Yes. But I mean, even something like right now, recording this podcast is part of an overall yes. goal. Mm-hmm. All the experiments I do in my lab are part of a goal. Mm -hmm. The reading I do is part of a goal. Um, even like the sitting down and eating dinner with my girlfriend is part of a goal. Yes. Right? Mm hmm So, and even like just taking a walk outside, part of goal of having yourself feel better about whatever you're doing. That's true. Right? So I bet you, you'd probably be the same way. Yeah, I probably just don't. You just don't... don't think of it in that framework. Yes, exactly. So if you do think of things in that framework, it kind of helps you with that productivity Mindset. It's probably much more satisfying. Yeah, exactly. That things in your in in your along your day have helped you achieve 
goals and, and you're making progress, even if you're not really seeing progress in the lab, you know, if what you've done all day is data collection and no analysis, so you have no results, mm -hmm. you see progress in other parts of your life towards these goals. Yeah. And I agree. It definitely feels more satisfying in the end. When I look back at my day, it kind of helps me feel like I got more done. Um, and when I feel like I got more done, it helps me be more productive the next day. So it's kind of this awesome positive feedback loop where I mm -hmm. keep getting more and more done and feel better about myself and yeah. know that I'm progressing, even though... Like, if I wasn't keeping track of my goals and progress, I I don't know, I would feel like I'm floating around a lot more, Yeah. right? Like, I, I don't have a purpose, and I definitely, this is something I implemented into my life in the last year or so, and yeah. it's definitely helped. I even, like, uh, for, for example, in research, I have this huge data set that I have to analyze right now, and it is so meticulous and boring, and it's terrible. But what I decided to do, instead of looking at all of these files that I have to go through, I ended up printing out sheets of paper for each one of the files that I need to go through with all of the, you know, different analyses that I need to do. Mm -hmm. And as I do them for each one of the files, I just make a check. Oh, man. On that piece of paper. That is not celebratory enough. You should set on fire. <laughs> to set ablaze that piece of paper that... Is that what you were expecting me to say? That's what you wanted me to say, No, I was you? actually <laughs> expecting you to, like, take a gun or a bow and arrow or something. And that's what I would do. No, even just that little check is satisfying, because I can watch those checks add up down that piece of paper, and when I get to the bottom, it's on to the next one. Yeah. And so it's just those little steps of progress and goal making throughout the day that, you know, instead of just going like, crap, I only made it through half of this file today. Mm -hmm. it, 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 yeah, in the scheme of things and the whole data set, that's nothing. But that's a lot of progress on a single file. So I just keep track of little things that way. Yeah. And that's why a lot of people make little to-do lists on a, mm -hmm. a day, but they don't I think many people tend to make a to-do list when they feel like they have too much to do, right? And they're like, okay, I need to figure this all out. But if you try to stick to it every day, that huge mess of things to do becomes a smaller list each day, yes. right? And then you do get that dopamine release when you check off the box for whatever you're trying to do. Yeah. Awesome. But right. perhaps one of the best way to keep track over time of what you do and how you accomplish your goals and the goals that you have is by journaling. Yes. I write in a journal probably every other night and have since I was 10 years old. Oh, wow. You are way better than me. I actually applaud <laughs> that. Um, yeah. So you've been doing a lot longer than I have. Yeah. Uh, so tell me what you think in general. I mean, you've had... I... Well, first of all, I can't remember anything. So having a journal... Yes. <laughs> It's really important in order to remember the little things in life. But I really enjoy actually going back to my old journals and seeing how far I've come. What was I thinking at this time last year? Have I changed anything since then? Have I progressed? Have I become more of an adult? Like, you know, uh -huh. just, just little things. It's nice to look back and see where you came from because not all the time you get to see that. You know, it's, it's pretty rare when you see the new first years come in and you get to interact with them a little bit uh, in grad school and it's like, wow, I started off like you? Like, that. wow, I've come yes. a far away. <laughs> but so that's a pretty rare moment and be able to, uh, so to be able to track it more closely in your own life through journaling, I feel like is pretty special. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Wow. I No, I'm just impressed that you've been journaling <laughs> since you're 10. Yeah. That's, you know... There's so many things that people wish they've done throughout their lives, right? Like, I wish I learned a couple of different languages that I know now so I could know all these things. And I wish I started when I was 10. And I wish I was, ran every day for the last 20 years. But I don't know. It's just journaling is one of them. Yeah. And I'm really impressed that you did that. So I've, I've only been journaling for about a year now. Um on and off. So one of the things with productivity I find is that 
it really is that positive feedback where I, as soon as I, if I get the ball rolling fast enough, I'm on it for a while, right? I, I had a really good streak through November, December, and January <laughs> of waking up way earlier than the cold winter that we just had would facilitate. Yes. <laughs> but I did it anyway. And every morning I had this awesome routine of like light working out and, uh, and we'll talk about that a little later, but journaling was one of them. And, and so I could record what I did yesterday or what I did at, by the end of yesterday. So like a report of yesterday, uh, a report of how I felt in the morning and a report of the couple of main goals I wanted to achieve that day. And so I, at first I limited myself to two goals, which would be something like finish this one experiment and read this one paper. Right. And then after a while, when two, what, when I was achieving those two goals really consistently, I'd move up to three and then four. Mm. And it was, then it was kind of hard to do more than three or four really. Yeah. But, um, but it was way better than when I was in my second or third year and just kind of stumbling around. Like some days I would show up in the lab and not know what to do for the whole day. So yeah. I might read a paper and then go home or I would get all ready for, to do this experiment. I wouldn't have the reagents I needed yeah. and I wouldn't know what to do. And then I would just waste a day or two. Yeah. Um, but with this, I at least have, I guess, contingent plans, right? So, if I can't achieve goal number one because whatever, X circumstances happened in the lab, I always have that other goal, and I probably have another goal as well. Mm -hmm. So I have two things I can really focus on. Yeah. And then if I finish that day with those two things achieved, I feel good. And then the next day I feel better because I keep doing this. So the journaling, just on the productivity front, and this is bypassing the whole emotional, like, you know, people journal about different things. Some people journal purely about work. Some people journal purely about their emotional state. And others journal purely on, I don't know, their workout progress, right? Like, it really yes, depends. Right. There are so <laughs> many reasons to journal, but I really do encourage you, the listener, to get a, I don't know, a little notebook and write down, or if you're more comfortable typing... Just start a, a Word document and write in it every day. Or speaking. Or you speaking. Could, you could do, like, yeah. re tape-recorded yeah. journaling. I actually video tried that. Video journaling. I tried that when we first started this podcast. I was trying to just get myself comfortable with listening to my own voice because I'm not one of those naturally. Like, even... I do some singing as well. And when I hear myself singing on a recording, I'm just like, oh, it's... So, it's just cringing, right? <laughs> Like, most people are like that when they see themselves on video or whatever, yes. right? That's the same kind of feeling yeah. I have. But then after editing this podcast for, I don't know, way too many hours, get used to it. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And so, work on your journaling. I encourage that highly. Uh, and I'd love to hear what you guys think once you start that out. Mm -hmm. All right? Journaling is kind of the basis for, or not basis, but is one way to encourage you to take advantage of the next few things we're going to talk about. And that topic is called motivational items, right? So what... Yeah. 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 Motivation. Um, <laughs> I use journaling as a motivational tool for myself. Um, mm -hmm. But there are a bunch of other things. And actually, maybe Kelly wants to start off with this because this is her suggestion. <laughs> yes. So motivational <laughs> wallpapers. What do you have? Do you have like that cat hang from the tree that says hang in there? No, no, no. Um, so as I've talked about before, I really enjoy the outdoors and traveling and, and doing anything with animals, all that kind of stuff. So last year I had three trips I was planning and I knew if I wanted to do these three trips, I had to get a ton of work done while I was actually in the lab. Hmm. So I made a PDF with pictures on it. Hey, Nikhil. <laughs> hey, Nikhil. Sorry to interrupt, guys. That's all right. <laughs> I'm Although so you didn't do the crazy that. Kramer entrance I predicted. Yeah. <laughs> Which apparently is way more silent than I thought. <laughs> uh -huh. All right. Fold your seat. Yeah, okay. fold your seat. I had a uh, 
meeting with my advisor, impromptu post lab oh, meeting. God. It's like I have an idea for your paper. It's a good idea. Oh yeah. Oh okay. good. Yeah. Oh good. Good. Yeah. Helpful advisors. That's always wonderful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Speaking of, we're talking about motivational items. Yeah, we're all the way down to motivational items now. Uh, motivational items. Yeah. yeah. So you're saying yes about how you had a couple of trips that you. Yeah, so I had a couple trips that I had planned, and I wanted to make sure that I got enough work done so that my PI would actually let me go on these trips. Yes. So I made a PDF of the most beautiful pictures of these places that I wanted to go. Mm -hmm. And I wrote in huge, bold letters on it. It said, it said, if you want to go here, there, and then there was a picture, and here, and then there was a picture, and here, and then there was a picture. It said, you have to get work done now. Oh. And so every single time I opened up my computer to go on Facebook, to do some candy crushing, whatever I was going to do that was going to waste time, I saw that wallpaper on my computer and I was like, you know what, I really should go flip those flies. I should go do that one more experiment. I, I should go get things done because I know I'm going to be having fun very soon. Yes. See, that's important to yes. have that kind of thing that... That drives you. I mean, some kind of thing to pull you or push you or anything like that, right? Some people have bosses that are like that. Some people are just internally self-motivated and they don't ever need to get some kind of outside source of motivation at all. I, I applaud you if, you if you can do that because... Yeah, <laughs> I don't know how people do that. <laughs> so for me, I think it's a little more complex than that, right? Like, uh, there's a lot of intrinsic motivation at the start of a project or at the start of something just because it's exciting. Um, so, you know, like, beginning a project is easy because you're inherently, you know, pushed to do that thing. But then when you get to the point where it's like you've either convinced yourself of something or, um, let's see, finishing stuff is hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's funny because actually the conference I was just at, um, it was, I mentioned this before on the podcast, it was the American Society for Artificial Internal Organs. Nailed that one, yes. Uh, and one of the speakers was ass like... Ass hair? Ass hair? Ass I I think they were calling oh. it. <laughs> ass hair! <laughs> hair. more stuff to believe out. <laughs> Um, but one of the speakers was like, there are two types of people. There are the starters and the finishers, and you need both types of people. And it might just so happen that maybe even the basic biologists skew towards the starters, right? We like the discovery and the learning the new parts. Mm -hmm. Whereas the finishers might be more the engineers, where they're like, oh, let's do a few iterations of this, get the best possible thing to ship out, and we'll see if we can't make a better version next time. Mm -hmm. See, but the trick to iteration is it's really just a sequence of beginning, 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 beginning. Right? Ooh. That's why... Yeah, but then they also have to the finish right. it, too. Right? They, they also have to decide on a point and ship out the product. Right, so there is a, a concrete goal at the end, right? Yeah. That makes finishing easier. Yeah. Right, I think what makes finishing hard for a lot of these projects that we tend to work on as research scientists is that there's no concrete endpoint. There's always more to learn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So how do you decide, okay, this is my actual end goal. And then, you know, it's easy to it's subdivide good. tasks into chunks and break things down, but it's hard to know, you know, how far that track is. Yeah. So. I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> I mean, I, I definitely feel like a starter half the time. And a finisher half the time. I don't know. It depends on the project. It depends how much I care about something or in which ways I care about something. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. How do you get yourself to care about things you don't naturally care about? Um, like Kelly has a good, good technique, question. right? Like use use some other carrot to dangle in front yes. of your face to get you there. But you know, are there any other ways besides external motivation, yeah. right? or I guess other forms of external motivation? There's usually some aspect of, I guess, any task I'm doing in which I could care about, right? So if I'm, let's just say there are, is a solution in lab that, or like a, you know, a, a chemical solution in lab that we need, but I don't use it all, my motivation would be to help out my lab mates and just make it or order it or something, find it. But it might be 
I guess, easier for me to want to do that if it were for my own project. But there's still the benefit of helping others and, you know, then we're a better lab, better as a lab, if I take that step and do it. So holding yourself accountable to other people. Yeah, well, that's one one way to do it. Mm -hmm. It really depends on what you're talking about. This kind of a... (laughs) The looming committee meeting is always a way to get motivated. Oh, yes. (laughs) There's yeah. always a committee meeting. Well, that's, 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 that's carrot and more fear of the stick. Right? Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah, you won't have health insurance in a year. Get your shit together. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, um, for me, I, I had a couple of motivational items that I listed. One was books or audiobooks or podcasts or, or something, um, and this kind of goes might skew towards the self-help-ish region, some people might call, or what do you call it, like, uh, motivational? Like Tony Robbins? Like, kind of like that, like but, the world is your oyster but I feel like that's always cheapening of it, right? Because uh, when you think of Tony Robbins, you're like, this big stadium with this guy on a stage saying, you can do it, and I don't know, that's what so, I think. I actually don't so know what Tony Robbins is. want to call it non-cheesy is. self-help. I, I want to call it that, but hey, whatever. Some people, for some people, that cheesy self-help Works. Does amazing things, right? So I I want to say whatever works for you. Um, one book that I've personally loved and helped me get motivated was uh, a book called Die Empty by Todd Henry, and it is kind of like a, you know a self motivational book. Um, but the premise is that you want to you know we all die. Sorry if you haven't known this, we're all going to die at some point. I guess the the main point of the book is to say that you should not die with holding in your best work. You want to die free of, you know, regret or free of wishing that you had done something. And so every day you can work towards that goal of getting your best work out there. So you don't really, so you're able to leave behind something, right? Whether it be a legacy or awesome family or anything like that. And so that's one of the things that's motivated me in my life. Um, but, you know, whatever works for you, what kind of... I don't know, do you have any books or... I mean, I have another one, too. I, I love the Steve Jobs biography. I didn't read that. It's really interesting. I listened to the audiobook of it, and it's just interesting hearing about someone's life who was... I mean, he was controversial and had a huge ego and personality and everything. But he also got a lot done, right? Like, the Apple Apple as we know it today and Pixar as we know it today are because of C. Jobs, right? Mm-hmm. Thinking of the things that motivated him or inspired him gets me to think about the things that motivate me or inspire me. And I think that's what people can get out of reading a good biography, whether it be, like, George Washington or Steve Jobs, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I encourage you to try that in case you might not have before. And if it doesn't work for you, that's also fine. So basically, use books and podcasts and other sort of media to look for um, patterns in what motivates other people. Exactly. Okay. So you're good at you're good at condensing this into the Yeah, we could do a five minute podcast. You ready? We could. <laughs> no, we could we can do the hour long one we usually do and then you come in and summarize everything mm-hmm. in that five minutes. Like episode two. <laughs> Nikhil Undoes everything just Jason just said. No, it's not undoing. It's tying it up. <laughs> tying it up. It makes it neater. It's, uh, he it's reiterates. Idea, idea bondage. As it were. For the idea bondage. Okay. What? <laughs> <laughs> All right. And we're running out of time. Well, what's, the, what's the Pomodoro technique? Yeah, so it, it's less of a... The Pomodoro technique, in case you've never heard of this before, it's not so much a motivational thing, but it, um, but it is a way to... I guess it's a time management strategy. It's uh, setting aside 25 minutes to focus on your work and then take five minutes after that to do whatever. You know, walk around, go on Facebook, and then 25 of work and then five off and then 25 and five. And so you split your time up into 30 minute chunks where you know that for 25 minutes you will be motivated and focused and for that five minutes, you can allow yourself to relax or do whatever that motivates you. Like, I don't know, play Candy Crush for five minutes or whatever. <laughs> so I think there's 
two things in response to that. One is um, I like the technique a lot. I've used something similar to that, but instead of using time as my chunk, mm -hmm. I usually use um, like small sub goals of my broader goal as my like so. Instead of working for twenty five minutes, I'll work till I finish one piece of the the problem I'm working on. Well, that's good. Right. Yeah. Um, whether it takes me twenty minutes or an hour, I'll just be like, I gotta finish this tiny thing, right? And if it takes too long, then obviously you can put a break in there and split it up. But like, you know, you should try to, I guess, partition your projects into small enough discrete chunks that you can do it in a short amount of time. But I think doing it that way, it's not like you, I work for twenty five minutes, I deserve a break. It's like I finish something, I deserve a break. Yeah. So there's a little more sort of. Um, I think that's good if you can stay in that, that track for a while. I know my mind wanders after about 15 to 20 minutes, so mm -hmm. knowing that I have that little chunk of time no matter what. Because usually I will assign myself to that one goal for that 25 minutes anyway. So it'd be like to write, you know, three paragraphs of this paper. Right. So in general, this is like a category of, of productivity tool or technique that's like willpower hack, right? Yeah. It's like how do you keep your yourself focused and on task, right? Mm -hmm. And so having some sort of external structure helps, like the Pomodoro technique or chunking your project into smaller sub-goals. But then, there, you know, um, it's also, I think, really helpful to be mindful that willpower is a finite resource. You only have so much in a given day. Um, and so if you're constantly switching from task to task to task, then you're wasting a lot of that willpower or focus or mental energy on doing sort of needless things. Um, and so, because uh, that switching takes time, switching right? takes yeah. time, and and yeah, exactly. For sure. Well, not just time, but also like effort, mental effort. Yes. Right. You have to like you know rewire a few things cognitively to get into like that same focus or flow for the task number two compared mm -hmm. to task number one. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, the, the Pomodoro thing I think is a good sort of model, but it, it may not work for you. So try to find some other thing in that vein where it's breaking the, the task down and having an external structure guide you. Mm -hmm. Structure. I, yeah. Feel, yeah, I feel like that's what we miss as grad students a lot, is structure in our yes. lives. Mm -hmm. So so if you can create that for yourself by doing something that's similar to this technique, perhaps, you know, and using Google Calendar and yeah. all of that kind of thing, you you develop, you give yourself the structure in your life that perhaps isn't there just by the intrinsic nature of your job. But you, but you say, okay, in the morning I'm going to write, and within that writing period I'm going to break it down to you know spending twenty minutes on the intro, twenty five minutes on the intro, then do a revision for another hour on the different section of the paper, and breaking it down into into chunks. So speaking of books, Jason, there's um, a book that I skimmed through recently, uh, actually in a bookstore, can you believe it? Um, what? Where, where uh, <laughs> it was a book about the daily routines of like highly creative people. And so... Huh. Um, it's I might have heard of... I can't, I I can't know remember this. the author, I can't remember the title. Yeah. I could probably do some Google Foo and find it for you for after the show. Yeah, we'll, we'll um, put it in the notes. Yeah. Uh, but what I liked about it is that, you know, even these people who are thought of as, like, super creative, highly productive people rely on structure to get them through, or they, you know, it's structured creativity. They set aside time to, like, you know, try out new things, maybe free write every morning when they wake up, like, roll out of bed and, like, you know, just start journaling yeah. for 10 or 15 minutes or whatever it is, whatever their routine might be. Like, that's what, that's definitely one of the myths of creative people is that they just stumble upon this idea or whatever. But no, it's usually that they create an environment that is very helpful for their creativity, right? They're always reading different things, like... Introducing breath into their yeah, like, world. Yeah, and, and just making links between all these different types of topics or books or lectures or it's anything. Like associative. Thinking. Yes, exactly. And so... You know, back to Steve Jobs, right? He was really interested in calligraphy. Um, and so when that when one of the first versions of the personal computer came out that they were working on, he was like, no, I really want the, the text that shows up on this monitor to be this. And to him, that was really important. And it was, you could really kind of see that in his personality, he's really interested in the aesthetics of everything. 
And you can see that, you know, in the iPads and iPhones we all use now, right? How simple graphics are and the way you use the apps and everything like that. There is a, I think, one chapter in that book in which Steve Jobs describes um, his experience with hallucinogens, like in his formative years, and how it, you know, he literally saw the world differently after that. Like, he would see geometric forms as their sort of component shapes. Uh, and I think he, he at least, ascribes some of that to his, uh, his like, acid trips when yeah. he was in college. So. Oh, man. But don't do drugs, kids. <laughs> yes. As Oren said, don't, don't do drugs. They all splice in Oren saying, don't do drugs there. <laughs> oh, okay. Sounds <laughs> like a lot of work. No, um, but the point is, he's, he put himself in an environment. Yes. That made him more creative. That's right. Right? This actually sounds like the book called Accidental Creative. Accidental Creative. Oh, I don't know. I, don't I, I always find, yeah, I always find that my most creative moments are in the shower, on the oh, toilet, I, like, why is that? It's so strange. Maybe just most relaxed in those moments. Well, maybe it's because, at least when I'm in the shower or on the toilet, I'm usually not reading or listening or... I'm not distracted by all these things. I'm actually letting my mind you. do its thing. Yeah. And then it can make those connections. I think it's... Part of it is, you know, being in the shower is like white noise for a lot of your senses. Like, you have that sort of constant oh, yeah. auditory stimulus, you have that constant mm -hmm. physical sensation, mm -hmm. and so it gets you in this state. I don't know if any of you have ever tried working with white noise in your headphones. Oh, yeah, no. I do it all the time. I really? actually use Coffitivity, the uh, the murmuring... Yeah. We talked about it before in the podcast, but I also have tried just, like, fan blowing or just general white noise, like static. Mm -hmm. I find that really helps me focus. Me too. And hmm. keep, keep, like my concentration on a single task. Maybe that's why I like John Mayer music, because it's all the same, oh, and so I just... Or Nickelback. Yeah, and I just, I listen to that on my headphones while I'm working, because it's just constant L noise. L literally <laughs> white noise. Oh. <laughs> oh. Sorry, we can take that one out. I can't say that. I only can say that, I guess. White noise! Yay. I can't say that either. I know. <laughs> Have you tried any of these techniques? Would you like us to talk about something that works for you? Leave us a quick comment at phdinprogress.com slash productivity, where you can also find the show notes to all the resources we mentioned today. You can also email us at feedback at phdinprogress.com. After 25 minutes of work, I'll usually check our Twitter account at phdpodcast. Say hi if you've got the free time. We also have a new goal only you can help us achieve. We would love to see 50 new reviews and ratings in the iTunes store. When we reach 50 reviews, we'll release a bonus outtake episode to everyone, and one reviewer will be randomly selected to either join us on the show via Skype, or we'll use his or her topic suggestion. As always, all the information I just mentioned here can be found at phdinprogress.com. Stop calling it school. Stop saying you're trapped. This is what you chose. This yes. is your life. You're living it right now.